Father, it's me, Michael. I found it. It was right where you said it would be. There is only one thing left for me to do now. I'm going to come find you. Nuh uh, not touching it. No, sorry, Bob. No way. You can mechanically wheeze all you want, Michael Eggs Benedict, Afton, Purple Guy, Jingleheimer Schmidt, but I am not. I am not spending another 20 minutes trying to piece together whether you're Springtrap, whether you're Purple Guy, whether you're a second Purple Guy, and whether all of this requires yet another rewrite of the timeline. I am not doing it. At least not until the next book comes out in June. Nope, no serene doggo. Today, the series that prompted lore-based theories to flood this channel is getting the old-school game theory treatment. That's right. Today, I'm tackling the science of Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> Hello Internet, welcome to Game Theory, where today's Freddy Theory is gonna be a bit different. No source code deep dives, no rooting around for obscure hidden easter eggs, only hardcore real life research. Oh, but speaking of the source code, something really fascinating is going on right now. Scott Cawthon's two websites are having a conversation. Scott Games is saying things like, you're crowding us, you can't tell us what to do anymore, we outnumber you, and the FNAF World website is replying with, be quiet, yes I can, you will do everything that I tell you to do. Which makes it seem like FNAF 6, Sins of the Father, it's my title, feel free to use it, Scotty C, is gonna be like an all-out animatronic Civil War-style battle against the OG creator William, aka Springtrap Afton. How awesome would that be? Title, gameplay, boom, done. Feel free to use that idea as well. Meanwhile, another FNAF update, since a lot of you have been asking me on Twitter about my thoughts on this, the movie got itself cancelled and then found itself a new production partner, Blumhouse Productions, the same guys who did Paranormal Activity, Oculus, The Purge, Get Out. Honestly, I think it's great news. Blumhouse has made a name for themselves by doing awesome movies on really teeny tiny budgets, and FNAF as an indie franchise needs that cheaply made indie vibe to really make it scary. It doesn't need a big studio like Warner Brothers, where it used to be, going in and meddling and trying to make it more family friendly so they can go in and sell more FNAF toys and it becomes the next Minions or something. Thing. Low budget is the way to go because it forces you to get creative. So this news actively made me excited for the movie. A video game movie based on FNAF. Seriously. All the subs to film theorists better get themselves ready for a heap and help and a Freddy when that movie rolls around. Anyway, enough updates. I think that covers all the FNAF related things that you guys have been asking me about on Twitter. On to the episode. This week I'm covering a topic I've wanted to do since the release of FNAF 4 back in 2015 and never had the opportunity to because I was always so busy trying to piece together the damn lore. And that is... Can an animatronic actually kill you? Since, you know, this series has a lot of animatronics and a whole lot of death at the hands of animatronics. But more specifically, I want to focus on the bite. <laughs> You know the one I'm talking about. Whether or not you believe this moment to be the bite of 83 or the bite of 87, whether or not the date really even matters anymore, one thing is clear. This is the moment that set in motion everything else in these games. Based on the evidence coming from six games and the Silver Eyes book, William Afton, creator of the animatronics, suffers this tragedy where his son's head gets crushed in a childhood bullying incident. A few days later, the son dies of his wounds in his hospital bed, setting in motion Afton's quest to quote put him back together cut to scoopings sister locations a dead daughter and more missing children than you can shake a basket of exotic butters at and all because of this one moment the bite is treated as a freak accident something that couldn't have been helped the horrific ending of an innocent childhood prank gone wrong a series filled with haunted puppets and reincarnated skin suits starts with this just a random tragic incident that nobody could have stopped a simple mechanical failure Remember, this is before any of the suits are haunted. It's still just a regular old animatronic. But is that really true? Does a regular old animatronic actually have the ability to crush a child's skull? Or is there something a bit more sinister going on here? Let me 
just say this. I will never look at my last sister location theories the same way again. And it's all thanks to the results of this episode's research. To begin to piece together the real danger these Disney rejects pose, we need to understand what makes them so dangerous in the first place. Sure, it might be easy to assume that Golden Fred Bear and Golden Bonnie here are so deadly because they're spring lock suits, but as we hear about in FNAF 3's phone calls, the locks are only used to hold back the sharp pointy innards so they could be worn in suit mode. To change the animatronics to suit mode, insert and turn firmly the hand crank provided by the manufacturer. Turning the crank will recoil and compress the animatronic parts around the sides of the suit, providing room to climb inside. Please make sure the spring locks are fastened tight to ensure the animatronic devices remain fixed. It's also something that we witness up close and personal during night four of FNAF's sister location. The spring locks hold back the robotic innards, and them unsnapping and releasing the mechanism is what makes them so deadly. But during FNAF 4's bite, Golden Freddy is already in robot mode. There would be no spring locks activated. They would not be snapping shut. To put it simply, the robot is operating like any normal animatronic would be, meaning that the danger is coming not from some weird, unique detail of FNAF verse style robots, but rather from the same mechanisms that exist in any animatronic, be it in a fictional pizzeria to the creepy remnants of Big Bear Jamboree heads looking down at you from the Winnie the Pooh ride in Disneyland. Go ahead, look it up. There's some nightmare fuel for ya. Or better yet, if you're at Disneyland leaving the Heffalump and Woozle section of the ride, look behind you and look up. Ho oh, oh, ho! Prepare for a surprise. Anyway, all things considered, to truly unwrap this theory, we need to know how normal animatronics actually work. Enter a man named Vern Grainer, an engineer who used to build robots for Chuck E. Cheese. Turns out, how these things are built is actually a closely guarded trade secret. Secret because I can pronounce my awas. But in an article he did for Nuts and Volts magazine back in 2009, he confirmed that almost every entertainment robot on the planet is built from one core technology, pneumatic actuators. What are those? Well, yo, listen up then. Ya homies know that when all the sickest ballers want to pimp out their banging rides, yo, they install hydraulic lifts in their undercarriage, like Ramon from the Cars movie. Well, where hydraulics use oil and fluid dynamics to do that sweet lifting, yo, pneumatics use air pressure. You build up a bunch of air pressure and then release it. That release moves whatever you want. A piston, a pulley, the deadly grin of a lifeless singing bear. They're used in everything from robots to build cars to the jaws of well, Jaws at Universal Studios. Now, Grainer doesn't specify how powerful the pneumatic actuators in a Chuck E. Cheese-style robot's mouth would be, but we can go ahead and calculate a rough estimate. Whereas other actuators in the body and legs would have to be more powerful since they're moving larger, heavier chunks of robot, the ones in the mouth are smaller, more delicate. They only have to move a couple of ounces of plastic and metal for the jaws, teeth, and cheeks. The pneumatic tubes themselves are also only a couple inches long, meaning that they can only build up so much air pressure. Pressure. All things considered, you're only gonna need about 40 PSI of air pressure max to do all of that. That's not a whole lot. It's like the pressure created from a strong breeze. So how the heck do a handful of small pistons powered by air create enough force to crack a child's skull wide open? Um they can't. You see, crushing a human skull ain't easy. The 22 bones of the human skull are there to protect the most important organ in our body from damage, and the whole thing has got a rounded structure to help disperse any forces applied to it. The strongest boxer in the world could punch you in the head at full force, and it barely crack. But this perfectly normal Chuck E. Cheese wannabe not only cracks the crying child's head, but breaks through hard enough to cause severe trauma to the brain? How much force is needed to do this? That. Well, it's actually a tricky question. First, we gotta ask, how old is the victim? When you're first born, the skull is softer, moldable, since, you know, it has to pass through narrow lady bits. Once it's made that journey, it has to be able to accommodate for your growing brain. So it has these soft spots called fontanelles to give the skull flexibility. So I immediately thought that our crying child birthday boy might be a bit easier of a nut to crack considering how young he is, but 
the research didn't pan out that way. The soft spots disappear or ossify by the time that you're 9 to 18 months old. And I don't care how heartless of a killer you are, purple guy, you ain't letting your one-year-old hobble his way home after a day of sitting terrified in a broom closet. Second, to answer the question I had to ask, what parts of the skull are we talking about? Because different sections have different thicknesses and, as a result, different strengths. According to research done by Tobias Matei, who studied children's bike helmets and how they protect the skull, the thinnest region of the skull bone is about where your temples are. Lo and behold, that's exactly where our crying child is seeing most of the damage done. When he's placed in Golden Fredbear's mouth by the bullies, he's facing outward towards us, mostly facing the camera, meaning that the weaker sides of his skull are the ones that are having to deal with the crushing forces of the teeth. So, I looked it up. To fracture the skull there would require the equivalent of a 1,100 pound man, or 500 kilogram woman, equal opportunity not being sexist here, to step on the head in that exact spot. But then again, that's just to have the thing fracture. We're talking about a catastrophic head failure that impacts the brain. So we have to get a bit more specific and a bit harder of a bite. Luckily, I found a study looking into exactly that. Testing over 300 samples, some scientific madmen determined that human skull bone, when put under various kinds of stress, had a failure pressure of 1900 PSI, or 13 megapascals. 13 megapascals means that for every square meter of surface area, it takes 13 million newtons of force to break a skull open. Now, obviously, that number is hard to imagine, without me giving you a real-world example of what it feels like. The challenge, though, is to accurately represent that pressure, we need to know how that pressure is being delivered. If I'm delivering a lot of pressure onto a small point, it's gonna do a lot more damage than if I deliver that same amount of pressure across a wider surface area. Think of it like the difference of stepping onto a single nail versus laying on a bed of nails. One's a bloody good party trick, the other is just bloody. So think about it this way, one megapascal of pressure is about the pressure of an average human bite. We're talking 13 times that. That is a lot of pressure. And in our case, that pressure is being delivered by small animatronic teeth clamping down on either side of the crying child's head. So, a whole lot more like that single nail example than the bed of nails. But to find out just how powerful and deadly these teeth are, we're gonna need one thing pixel measurements. We need to know the surface area of Freddy's teeth, so that we can figure out how much force minimum those teeth are delivering. Now, obviously we're gonna have to approximate a bit since the game contains no real measurements to go off of, so instead I started with Freddy's face. It's an easter egg I never really addressed in the theories, but way back in vanilla FNAF 1, lots of theorists were talking about an oddly shaped smudge on Freddy's face. This smudge is in the shape of a handprint. Now granted, it isn't a golden suit, but as we see in that game, the two are comparable in size. Given that the average human hand is about 18.89 centimeters long, we can use this handprint to scale everything else. Freddy's head then is 32 centimeters wide, or about twice as wide as an adult human's head, which makes a lot of sense. You need something big enough to serve as a costume. Now using a combination of images from different angles, we can use this to determine the dimensions of one tooth, which comes to 1.5 four square centimeters. It looks like he was bitten with eight teeth, four on the top and four on the bottom. This gives us a total surface area of 11.26 square centimeters. So using the power of math, we can use this figure to determine how much force each tooth is biting down with. And that number is bone chilling. 14,758 newtons. Why is that a bone chilling number? Because that's the strength that a full grown crocodile bites with. It's almost the strength of a great white shark bite. In order to deliver that amount of force, you would need two high end industrial strength pneumatic actuators. These things are as long as your arm and they need their own dedicated compressors pumping out 100 pounds per square inch. I mean, your own teeth would crack if you bit down with that kind of force. And it is most certainly way over overkill for moving the mouth of some cheap mascot at a sad sack themed restaurant. It's almost like someone built these things to intentionally be deadly.
And there, ladies and gentlemen, is our smoking gun. When we last covered the lore of this series, myself, as well as other FNAF theorists like Treesicle and Daco, concluded that William Afton was driven to his murderous rampage by tragic circumstances. His son was killed in the jaws of that machine, and so he dedicated his life to twisted experimentation on other children to bring his son back. Sure, it doesn't mean that William Afton kidnapping and killing tons of kids is okay, but it does make us sympathetic with him a little. He was driven to madness by this immense sadness. But if all this science today is truly correct, it proves that he was a madman all along. That even in the earliest days of Fred Bear's family diner, William was making suits designed to kill. With mechanisms way overpowered for what they were meant to do. Any normal animatronic would have left the crying child with a few scratches, maybe some psychological scars, but that's about it. He'd be alive. But Afton, being the psychopath that he is, had other intentions. Not only did he create a deadly system with the spring locks, but even the basic robotics of his mascots were built to kill, something that he would continue to do throughout his career, particularly with the Funtime series. We all thought it was a freak accident that killed Afton's son, but at the end of the day, this death was completely avoidable. It was all Afton's fault. He only has his own twisted experiments to blame, claiming first his son, and eventually his daughter too. Man, I gotta say, that really bites. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Six whole months since the FNAF theory? Wow, time flies. It's actually really nice to cover the series again with fresh eyes. I even figured out some new lore bits while working on this one, stuff that I'm sure will show up in the next FNAF theory coming this summer. So if you haven't done it yet, make sure that you bite down hard on that subscribe button in three, two, one, crunch! And hey, might I recommend clicking the video that you see on screen right now? It's actually the first video that I did on FNAF. It's actually really interesting to see how the series have changed in that amount of time. Anyway, that's it for today. I will see you all, or at least the number of you who enjoy our theories that aren't FNAF related, next week.